My name is Sandy Rothman. Jerry came into the music store where I was working in Berkeley and, and uh, told me they, that I was going to be their guitar player. No, he said, no, we, we, we'd like to have you play guitar in our bluegrass band. He had his sidekick, David Nelson, with him, and their guitar player, Eric Thompson, had just quit the band. So they were looking for a guitar player. That's how we actually met. Where his interest in band came from is a really interesting question because where did anybody's interest in banjo came, come from? I and mean, there were there were so there were so many of us in the kind of in you know folkies, folk nicks, whatever, who were probably mostly strumming around guitars and that kind of thing. And then some people, when they first heard the sound of banjo, whether it was bluegrass style banjo or pre bluegrass old time banjo, or even some other form of banjo like ragtime banjo, four string that was in Dixieland music and, and New Orleans music back in the twenties. You know, some people, for some people, it just rang this bell. I guess that's an appropriate banjo term. And just said, I want to do that. And I think, uh, I think I read Jerry saying something close to that, you know. In that, in that article you're talking about, I, I quote some other people who wrote an article about Jerry's banjo playing. And he said, just the clarity, the brilliance, you know, he described the qualities of a banjo. And he said, it just, it just struck him like, I want to, I've got to do that. And, yeah. you know, I think a lot of us had that same experience. But he was so ahead of the game, you know, at least compared to me. Of course, he's a couple of years older. But um, he, he knew so much about old time music already by the time we met. And I, I really didn't. I was, I, I was kind of into blues and folk. I grew up in Oakland and Berkeley. We had Jesse Fuller and Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry were around. And I heard a lot of that kind of thing. And I wanted to play that kind of finger picking guitar blues stuff, you know, and then um, bluegrass kind of caught me like it did a lot of other people. But Jerry was ahead of this game. He had already played in several configurations of, of old time music, Pri you know, I mean, starting around 1960 probably. We didn't meet until late 63. So yep. he, he already had this huge catalog of, of music he already knew. There was the Harry Smith collection, you probably heard of that. Um, you know, he, he'd already absorbed, he'd, he'd already inhaled all of that and was, knew all of that stuff. I, you know, and he was kind of into the, into the New Lost City Ramblers by then, and they were interpreters of that. And he, he, uh, he was, a, I think he was a parallel to Mike Seeger. I think he was our West Coast Mike Seeger, you know, in that way, in terms of being really involved in it. The only thing missing from it was involvement in the culture, because he didn't, you know, that's something he didn't know about. And later he found out he didn't really want to be involved in, it, in that culture. But that's a whole different story. So you, you talked about a, a very interesting choice of words. Um, you talked about inhaling something. Um, <laughs> let's, let's fast forward a little bit of time here um, and talk about the exhale. Um, what was your experience watching Jerry's evolution into the Grateful Dead's lead guitar player, that style uh, of, of guitar playing, and similarly as one of the band's primary songwriting contributors? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, he, uh, 
one thing it should be said, the jury, I'll just say this on the side, the jury actually never stopped playing the banjo. I mean, anytime I was at his house, that banjo case was always visible. It was usually in the living room, right near the records and the TV, and he was picking it up all the time. And we had times of getting together over the years when the Grateful Dead was going, you know, pretty much full tilt, and he was still playing the banjo, you know. But yeah, I mean, he, um, that's, you know, it's a really difficult question in a way. He, he, he brought a lot of things to the guitar that, at least according to he, what he said, felt to him that they came from the banjo. You know, he brought a lot of banjoistic technique to, to the guitar. That thing of, you know, that thing he does on the guitar of landing on a note and really giving it what he might call a personality. He put meaning into, into his notes, you know. And sure. when you're playing the banjo, that's kind of, that's a big thing there because you can't really it's critical, it's got all these critical details in it, you know, and he'd come from that world of playing all those little critical details. And I think he brought a lot of that to his guitar playing. You asked about what is my experience of watching him yeah. become a guitar player like that. And, yeah. you know, I was totally blown away by it. I mean, I, I used to go to shows and sit behind his amplifier and just, even though I didn't really know their repertoire very well, I would sit uh, back there, you know, just just slightly backstage and just, just could not believe what I was hearing, you know. He had made so much musical progress, had gone so far into understanding music, you know. Um, he knew a lot before, but he, he just kept progressing. And he, I remember being at Jerry's house and seeing, you know, jazz workbooks and all this difficult instructional stuff sitting around, you know. He was working at it all the time. You know, he didn't, he didn't rest, he, he just kept working. A little glass of wine, which is the Stanley Brothers was the Stanley Brothers recording. It has about six or seven verses. It's a story, you know, it's, it's a murder ballad. And uh, we, yeah, the, the big joke was that we could never remember all the, all the verses in the proper sequences. We usually get them mixed up, you know, or the, the wrong thing happened before the other thing, you know, was a, the, the sequence was all generally off. <laughs> we tried to remember it, but this particular occasion, when we went over to have dinner with Jerry, um, after I came back from Japan and after he'd been just out of the hospital in that everybody knows what I'm talking about there. Um, you know, that those days when he was just out of the hospital. Um, and we, we, I kind of thought maybe he would, the, the word was that he had forgotten a lot and was trying to restructure his mind back into music. And Mountain Girl said she thought it would be a good idea if we all played together again, maybe he, it would help him remember some things. And I expected him not to remember things, you know, but we played, we decided to try that song and he remembered every single word in the right order, which was amazing. I don't think he ever recorded that. It's, it was just a big favorite of his, of all of ours, of the Stanley Brothers. You know? Got it. It's a beautiful, oh. beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sounding recording. I, I was thinking earlier today that one, if I had to pick just one word to apply to that whole range of thought, it would be improvisation because I think Jerry's life was improvised, you know? I mean, yeah, he was in this, spent that short time in the service, but outside of that, which was regimented, obviously, for as long as it didn't last. But, uh, you know, he, he uh, I don't recall that he had any other jobs except teaching uh, music at Dana Morgan's there, but uh, he, he improvised it from, from as early as he could, right until he couldn't anymore. Yeah. Which, you know, he, I think he, he gave that, that idea out without talking about it, you know, just, yeah. look, you know, if you look at his life, that's a major, fe a major feature, I think, you know, yeah, well, you, can do it, you can do what you want to. Of course, in this day and age, and with the situation we have these days, it's going to be a little harder to do how, how are you going to actually pay the rent, you know? Yeah. I mean, we don't all have the fortunate situation that he did, which is to have a wonderful community of friends in Palo Alto there in the folk scene who supported everything that was going on. And when they when things got rolling, they were all still there. And that family is still the Grateful Dead family. And so he had a wonderful support network. Yeah, and, and that I think that that's that's exactly what we're celebrating today. So um, and, and for the rest of, uh, of the week, plus a few days of programming that the community has been so generous to um, to contribute. So I think, Sandy, with that, uh, we will conclude our interview. And if you'll join me um, in welcoming everybody to day number two of the days between uh, today is Bluegrass Day, where we explore um, artists like Del McCurry and the infamous Stream Dusters and Railroad Earth who have been impacted 
and were a huge part of Jerry's Jerry's life and uh, posthumously and so on and so forth. So, uh, so yeah, Sandy, if you'll join me in uh, in welcoming the community to today's programming, that would be great. I, I'd love to do that. And Jerry was a big part of their life. We could say that too. So, yeah, oh, great. Welcome, that, welcome to them all. Yeah. That, thank you very much, uh, Sandy Rothman. Um, longtime friend of Jerry's, member of the Jerry Garcia Acoustic Band in the late 80s, uh, whose content will resurface on August 9th in part of the 75th birthday celebration. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. That Del McCurry still sings, and he was the lead singer for Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys in 1965. Uh, around that time for a couple years, he showed up around the same time as a young man named Bill Keith, and they both were there to try out for the banjo position in Bill Monroe's band. And Bill Keith was an excellent banjo player, really advanced, ahead of his time. He's one of the fathers of what we call the melodic banjo style, where you play complicated melodies across the strings. A lot of players do this now, and it seems kind of like normal. But back then, he was the first guy to do that, who actually could, could play melody lines, and they do it by going across the strings, and that's the way banjo works. So, so Dell said, well, I'm not gonna compete with him, so, uh, but Bill, but he said, told Bill, I'm a good lead singer, and he'd sang some songs for him. So Bill put him on rhythm guitar, and put uh, Bill Keith on banjo. However, there could not be two Bills in the band, um, so uh, they used his middle name Bradford, and Bill called him Brad Keith. And when he'd introduced Dale McCurry, he'd say Dale, so people thought his name was Dale. Um, and this was a band that Garcia was, was, uh, saw live lots of times. And Bill Keith was one of Garcia's banjo heroes. Aside from Earl Scruggs, he was probably the biggest influence on Garcia's banjo playing was Bill Keith. So that song is appropriate in that, uh, and, and Bill, uh, you know, Bill Monroe never knew about Garcia, but Garcia was studying banjo, bluegrass banjo, really hard, and he really, his dream was to be in the Bluegrass Boys. He was working his way up to like playing with Bill Monroe in, in, in that time, 64, 65. Um, and then that all kind of, he kind of gave up on that for lots of reasons. And Grisman was a, was a connection and they went down south and there's just a lot of kind of backwoods kind of, you know, they, they, they didn't like long hairs and things like that. And, <laughs> and, uh, and Garcia eventually got kind of, um, burned out on the bluegrass system because it's such a closed system of music you got your particular licks your particular things yeah. and he decided to kind of reinvent himself and 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 kind of put that whole thing away and then fortunately it came back with olden in the way in the early 70s and he, he took up the banjo again and got really good again and and and, and we got to hear garcia play like real bluegrass music uh, but anyway of course the dead did this song in their um kind of more rock version but they they certainly got it from bill monroe and that's kind of the version we played well, I married me a wife, gave me trouble all my life, left me out in the cold rain and snow. Rain and snow. 
Hi, uh, my name's Cliff Seltzer, and uh, I'm working with the Bluegrass Museum Hall of Fame in Owensboro, Kentucky. And we are assembling a Jerry Garcia banjo exhibit. And one of the many people that we're working with is a uh, legendary mandolin player, Jesse McReynolds. Jesse is the oldest member of the Grand Old Opry. He's put out over 60 records with his brother, Jim. Uh, he's released, he's had multiple syndicated radio shows, and I'm thrilled to have you on the program today. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm doing pretty good, Chris. I good. To get our, get our pictures lined up here where we can see all right, but it's good to see you. Good to see you. When did you first hear of Jerry Garcia? Uh... I, I heard, I heard, uh, we did quite a few shows uh, on programs they had in Texas, really. We played some out there with some uh, uh, shows and I got to play on the big sound system out there. The day, the day they weren't there, but we was there one day early uh, and did our show. But we, I think we was about the first group that played on the show, and uh, and uh, that's first first time I had heard of the Grateful Dead because, but if anybody didn't hear the Grateful Dead, they must they must not have been here <laughs> because <laughs> I hear you. Um, and, and when you played, was it a Grateful Dead show or was Jerry with the Bluegrass Band? No, that was the the uh, the. Uh, the Grateful Dead show. So you played in that giant wall of sound with those speakers that were, I don't know how many feet high sound system ever created. Mountain of sound. And uh, but I always remember that. But before, when, when we played with the uh, uh, Old and In the Way, uh, Jerry was on that show with Vassar Clemens and the uh, a lot of the group that was on there, that was in California. Yeah. And uh, so in in a old old uh, copy of the Music City News, where uh, uh, what's the boy's name, the mandolin player that, that, that wrote, he wrote an article about me, and it's one of the best articles I ever heard. Uh, I read in uh, the magazines back then, and. Uh, Jack Toddle was his name, and he did, did a real good job. And, uh, and I was on the same show with, with Jerry, and we did the first Bluegrass Festival they had in California. And uh, we was on that show. I didn't know 
I didn't remember that we was on that show and, until I read that article in the uh, in the magazine that uh, Jack Tonnell wrote, and uh, uh, I, it dawned on me that I must have met Jerry on that show because we we were all out there together, and that was the first bluegrass festival they had in California, according to uh, Jack's writing on that. And I said, well, I, I guess I, I must have met uh, Jerry somewhere out there, but I said, it did dawn on me that that was the uh, a bluegrass festival that we played. I, uh, I don't have the paperwork on it right now where it was, but it was around Los Angeles or San Francisco, right close to where Jerry was living at. Did you play on many festivals that uh, Jerry played on? Well, that was the only one I, that's the only one I know of, yeah. That's the one you know of. Well, in two, was I, I got to uh, looking through our schedule on the write-ups we did in different magazines, because uh, I'm trying to write my book for um, Dennis McNally, who was the uh, writer and uh, publicity man for the Grateful Dead. And uh, he was, he was the manager and, uh, the booker of me when I did the great for the uh, project. That was the last thing I did. And uh, that's how I got to, to know about Dennis McNally. He was one of the greatest writers that uh, that we had writing in any any type of business. And uh, we played a benefit show for Jerry Garcia in uh, San Francisco with uh, Dave and Nelson. This was uh, uh, about 10 years ago, close to that, yeah, I guess. And, uh, oh, it was amazing what a reception we got on that uh, benefit show we did for Jerry. And uh, it was for some uh, some benefit. And his wife was, was there, his daughter was there. And uh, all the the uh, devoted fans to the Grateful Dead was was at that show, and it, it was amazing, amazing thing. In two thousand and ten, you put out an amazing record. It's called Jerry Garcia, Robert Hunter, the songs of the Grateful Dead, and I, I have to tell you that I've heard a million different rec acoustic recordings of the Dead, and that record that you put out my opinion is the best of all of them so how did that record come about how did you go about choosing songs and also how did you go about choosing the players to be on that record well i said my wife uh, was a fan of jerry garcia and uh, uh she kept telling me she said you should listen listen to the things that the grateful dead are doing especially the guitar playing. And, uh, and uh, Sandy Rothman used to be Jerry's uh, traveling partner. And uh, Sandy contacted uh, me and my wife. And uh, we, he came, came to uh, uh, Nashville and spent some time with us. And I guess he was one of the people, him and her, they uh, suggested that I consider doing a Grateful Dead uh, record uh, tribute to Jerry Garcia. And I said, well, I never, that's what I, I got to think about, that. did I ever meet Jerry Garcia? And I'm sure, because cause he was coming back uh, from California, uh, back east and taping our TV show. And uh, he was a fan of, of me and Jim and Alan Shelton, especially because Jerry was a banjo player. And uh, I didn't know that this was going on until uh, 15 or 20 years later. And uh, so uh, I said, well, she had all, all the albums that uh, Jerry had, had collected and the thing they had done in the business, you know. And uh, I said, well, give me some uh, albums to listen, listen to. So uh, 
the first thing I heard was uh, Black Muddy River. And, uh, and I said, well, I think I could do that. But uh, if I'm going to do Grateful Dead music, I want to do it in a way that uh, the Grateful Dead fan will not turn on me on it. So you're not doing it right. So I got uh, David Nelson, who was uh, one of the, the first members of the Grateful Dead band when they started. I, I suppose it was the first. But uh, I got David Nelson to, he got uh, Stu Allen, who was a guitar player that's played with the Grateful Dead band. And uh, they they came to Nashville when I was working on the album. And uh, I got uh, Stu to play electric guitar and, uh, and David Allen also. And me and David did some duets together and it just kept falling together. It took me five years to do it. Mm. Because I, I wanted to do it in a way where the uh, Grateful Dead fans would uh, accept the way I'm doing this. I know other Bluegrass bands had done uh, some Grateful Dead uh, albums, and uh, but they just did it in a straight way. And I said, well, I think we ought to do this as close to the way the Grateful Dead did it in the breakdown of who was going to play on it and the instrumental. And uh, Stu Allen, he could do a, a lot of uh, of uh, Jerry's guitar playing. And uh, so we, I got him to help me sing on a couple of songs and, and uh, it just fell together. It took a long time. I, I uh, had a lot of uh, dis uh, encouragement of trying to do so. Why am I going to do something like this? Because uh, a lot of other people had done that, and it wasn't too much of a success, I guess. But uh, I, I just got to uh, after uh, me and David. And Stu got to doing some things while uh, we was doing it in uh, in Nashville. Uh, we finally got it out, got it together, and I said, now what do we do with it? So uh, I pitched it to a lot of record labels, and, and nobody was interested in it and, uh, until I heard about uh, Professor Louie and the Chromatics. What was okay. their name? But he had the record. The record label in, uh, in New Jersey, and uh, I just about gave up on. I don't think I'm going to put this, get this thing out because nobody seemed to be interested in it. But uh, I made a deal with him. To he was the only one that really was interested in putting. In he he done a lot of stuff with Jerry, and uh, we got to work on some shows together. With, with him on it, and uh, uh, the uh, another name of the group was, uh, uh, gosh, I, I can't remember half of these people, but we'll have to, have to pick it up as it come along. <laughs> but uh, uh, I got Stu, uh, I mean, um, the guy with the, and, uh, and well, we made a deal with him to put it out, and that's where Dennis McNally came in. Uh, I got cut a hold of Dennis McNally. I said, I, I need somebody to help me do this, manage, manage me on this record. And uh, so he got me, I hired him to do the publicity on it, and he put, put me on uh, probably every rock and roll radio station that, that he put the Grateful Dead on when he was, when Jerry was living. And uh, I guess he, I was doing 10 or 15 radio interviews every day for about two years there and working the uh, Grateful Dead shows too. Did that record change your life or career at all? Or did you start playing 
any larger uh, venues after that came out? Put me in a uh, a, uh, a role that I had never played before, and it made grateful to dead people was wrote interviews on it, and uh, and I said, well, it looks like I've got the grateful dead people people on my side, so uh, I kept. Uh, I worked with Dennis about two years on it. He would do all the publicity. And that's, we did a lot of shows with uh, uh, Professor Louis and uh, uh, a lot, lot of other Grateful Dead fans. And I just uh, was, was thankful that I had the Grateful Dead people on my side. That was my thing. For sure. In, in 19, I think it was 1964, uh, there was a famous trip that Sandy Rothman took Jerry down south to listen to all the bluegrass masters, and he had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and he was taping uh, people like you to expand his knowledge of uh, bluegrass music, and there weren't a lot of LPs to listen to, so um, they were trading tapes back and forth, and I'm just wondering if if that really led to uh, the band encouraging taping in all of their shows, because so many Grateful Dead shows were, were taped and passed around, and that might have been a result of, of Sandy going down there with Jerry and taping. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm, I'm sure it must have influenced them quite a bit, because I, I didn't know this was going on, or uh, didn't, didn't know back then. Uh, who Jerry Garcia was, or or, or Sandy Rothman, either one. But but they made a lot of, a lot of trips all the way from California to tape our their TV shows, and they was really interested in Jesse at that time. And yeah. I think you tell me they went to a lot of festivals where we played, and uh, and they uh, he said Jerry was. Uh, hesitated to come up and speak to us for stars i guess so that's that's how i got to uh, know about uh, jerry and well, the he things he said hello to you and i'm i'm sure i must have come face to face to him a lot of time but he was just a doctor fan you know and uh, i just uh, just went along with well we we had a lot of fans at that time that would come to the festivals and he happened to be one that uh, uh, him and him and Sandy was uh, was hesitating to come up and ask us for an autograph. So we, we were superstars to him. I don't know, but uh, that's how that's as close as, as I ever got to know Jerry as a, as a fan. Yeah, uh, when they come up and. Uh, uh, they'd come up and I guess look around and uh, see everybody else getting autographs and they said we don't want to do that <laughs> you know well, almost but, uh, everybody heard heard the record old in the way which came out I think in 1973 and it was the largest selling bluegrass album ever until a brother or thou came out but uh, you had told me that you were asked to join old in the way I didn't listen. I didn't listen to him very much. I, I heard it when he came out because someone, one of the producers, I don't remember which one it was, they called us and wanted us to play on Olden and Olden. And uh, at that time, we were so busy on the road doing our own shows that, and we were trying to record and uh, work the Grand Ole Opry. And we were some busy people at that time, and. Uh, we just couldn't couldn't go to California to do that. Yeah. Holding in the way, I guess we had done it, there, but I wish we had been able to do it. But it's one of the things that we we had to skip a lot of uh, a lot of things that we didn't have time to do. It's just tough. Well, I think a lot of Grateful Dead fans don't realize that you know Jerry was uh, first and foremost a bluegrass musician, and um, so many songs in the Grateful Dead catalog uh, are based upon traditional bluegrass songs. I, I wrote down a couple of them. 
uh, cold rain and snow, deep Ellen blues, going down the road feeling bad, which I never would have guessed would have been a bluegrass song, and sitting on top of the world. And uh, th these were all tunes that have always remained in the dense repertoire. Did you ever play any of those tunes in your uh, in, in your well, concerts? When I was when I was growing up, uh, before I even picked up an instrument, why well, uh, I uh, used to listen to my, uh, of course, my granddad was a fiddle player, and uh, and my dad was a he uh, was a little pretty good musician, and and but he had a brother that that played uh, guitar and banjo, and he sung deep elm blues, and uh, I used to go to my my uh, brother-in-law's house. He married my sister, and I used to go down there on uh, Saturday nights and and uh, hear my uh, Everett was his name. I know he would the on the tune he would sing by play, and playing the guitar was Deep Ellum Blues. I always remembered that because uh, especially when I heard Jerry do it, I said that song I grew up listening to. So. But he, they did all of those songs like that, sitting on top of the world, and uh, well, Deep Ellum and uh, Jerry was a, uh, was an innovator when it comes to going back and and picking up some uh, good old songs like that, uh, like sitting on top of the world. And J Jerry was part of many bluegrass bands. I just listed a few of them: the Sleepy Valley Hog Stompers. The Heart Valley Drifters, the Wildwood Boys, and I think his last one was the Black Mountain Boys. Did you ever see any of those bands? Uh, I probably did, because we played with so many different bands. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of folk music bands in Pennsylvania that we we worked with a lot of a lot of shows. Uh, thank, thank Relics Magazine and the Rex Foundation and Rolling Stone and everyone else for putting uh, this week on celebrating the life of, of Jerry. And I hope to see you soon. And you take care of yourself. Okay, Chris. It's been nice talking to you.
very much. Right now we're going to do a, the Fiddle Players National Anthem because everybody that learns to play a fiddle is going to learn this first thing. This is Orange Blossom Special. I'm going to get some of my friends to come out. I got a lot of them. <laughs> to help on this. It's called the Orange Blossom Special. Thank you.
Bad day, everybody. Bass and Clemens. All those great fiddlers.
like Jack and Jill Mama told the jailer One here up, one cool down Did nothing for the tailor Just like Jack and Jill
Rex is unique in that it funds little independent scrappy organizations that aren't getting a lot of attention or funding from elsewhere. Courageous people with an idea, maybe an outside the box way of addressing a need who've seen a need and just charge in there to serve it. And often they don't have much money on hand and so our grant can take them to the next level. But they're the unusual finding the niche kind of nonprofit organizations and people who are really making a difference by seeing the need and going in and serving it themselves. My absolute favorite thing about being with Rex is the stories that our grantees tell, some of them absolutely harrowing stories. They're, the grantees are courageous people, like a woman who went to the most notorious refugee camp in Europe called Moria in Greece, just a horrendous place with three times as many refugees from Syria than it is built to hold and people who've crossed the Mediterranean. She's a longtime English teacher, retired in Oakland, and she goes to places to teach people not only English, but to teach English teachers how to teach English. So she went to this refugee camp where the so-called English class room, the classroom is a shipping container, no windows, freaking hot in the summer, wicked cold in the winter, but there's 200 people lined up outside to learn English because English is the ticket out. You can get an asylum hearing if you know any English. And yet as she arrives, there's just a chalkboard, no chalk, no paper, no technology, no nothing. She has to learn how to teach English under these circumstances, and she's developed a whole curriculum of games and dances and memorizing Beatles songs, believe it or not, Memorizing Beatles songs is a good way to learn English. And she figured out that she could record these as YouTube videos and anyone in the world could access this curriculum of how to teach English in refugee camps everywhere. So she took a videographer with her from this wonderful organization we funded in Oakland called Youth Beat. They teach urban youth careers in digital media like TV and radio and online. And they taped her doing these exercises to teach people English with no supplies whatsoever. And then we paid the students at YouthBeat to edit these into a suite of videos that you can see on YouTube called Teach English Now that can be accessed all over the world. So Charlotte saw a need and went in there. She's been doing it on her own dime up until Rex gave her a grant to just cover her expenses, to have an absolutely brilliant approach to a real, real problem in the world that we can help. And that is why, as Rex, it is so important that we're part of these stories. And anybody who donates to Rex or comes to our event, our events, are, they're part of these stories, these amazing stories that kind of spread all over the globe. And that's what keeps me going, and that's what gives me hope. Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead have shown a light and continue to shine a light on all of life's possibilities and potential. I was first drawn to the crazy traveling Bohemian Circus back on the East Coast. I was lured in by the power of the drum circle. My eyes opened to what was possible. The trance, the movement, the exotic, colorful people really made me feel like I was at home. Once I got into the music and the lyrics, it started to connect me with something deeper in my own spirit. I was able to realize I had a lot more potential than that was in, what was in front of me. And um, to this day, the music of Jerry and the Dead inspire the journey. Uh, Winter Wondergrass and Camp Out for the Cause have really um, benefited from all that I've learned on tour with the Dead and all the music and everything that I brought in, the wisdom and the magic of the road and all the people I've met along the way. I'll never forget selling endless loaves of broccoli, garlic, grilled cheeses and a new pale ale out of California that I still like drinking today. The power of the Grateful Dead, Jerry Garcia, all the lyricists, and everybody that's been involved with that family continues to inspire and empower 
this generation and the next generation, watching it evolve over time, and the different age groups coming and going, and feeling the love, that pure love, that sense of wonder and magic that was originally laid out by the dead is going to be there forever. And I'm grateful to be a part of it. Working on the new railroad with the mud up to my knees. Working on the new railroad with the mud up to my knees. Working for old John Henry, you know he's so hard to please. I've been all around this world. Mama and Papa and baby sister makes three. Mama and Papa and baby sister makes three. Drag me down to the gallows, boys, that'll be the end of me. I've been all around this world. Upon the Blue Ridge Mountains, well, there I'll take my stand. Upon the Blue Ridge Mountains, there I'll take my stand. A rifle on my shoulder, six shooter in my hand. I've been all around this world. Gone in with my old 44. I've been all around this world. Said, in fact, it's gonna cost you your life. Dupree said, 
church, you know that seems to me to be about right. Baby, baby's gonna lose her sweet man. Debris come out with their losing hand. Baby's gonna weep at home for a while. Then go on out, find another sweet man, gonna treat her with style. Judge said, son, I know your baby well. But that's a secret I can't never tell. Dupree said, Judge, well, it's well understood. And you got to admit that that sweet, sweet jelly's so good. Well, you know, son, you just can't figure. First thing you know, you're going to pull that trigger. And it's no wonder your reason goes bad. Jelly roll will drive you stone mad. Same old story and I know it's been told Some like jelly jelly, some like gold Many a man's done a terrible thing Just to get his baby a shiny diamond ring
call it you and guess it's time you go just one thing that I ask you just one thing for me please forget you Ain't nobody 
watching us stand in your shoes, washing the feet in the river in the morning. Everything promised is delivered to you, but don't neglect to be cut. What you share with all the winter birds are just singing for now. Sing sweet 
engine just cleans Driving that train High on cocaine Casey Jones You better watch your speed Trouble ahead Or trouble behind And you know that notion Just crossed my mind Driving that train everybody yes. 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 appropriately bump that one up a little bit at the end. spirited man I'm just feeling the spirit
Hey there, music lovers. You're about to see a little video that Jerry Garcia and I made about 30 years ago. It's hard to believe that time has gone by so fast. This was directed by my daughter Jillian and Justin Kreutzman and uh, it was filmed in a little nightclub in San Francisco in black and white. And there's some wonderful cameo appearances by some of our friends, the great master of deception, Ricky Jay is stealing cards. Rudy Cipolla is a great mandolin player and composer. He's the bartender. Decibel Dave Dennison, our recording engineer, he's sitting at the bar and maybe you can recognize a few other folks in there. Uh, I got a real kick out of seeing Jerry getting made up as a 1930s gangster. And we hope you enjoy it. And I just want you to know the thrill is still not gone. When the axe fall down Take up the yoke and plow the fields around Gone are the days when the lady said Please, gentle Jack Jones, won't you come to me? Brown-eyed women in red grenadine The bottle was dusty but the liquor was clean Sound of the thunder with the rain pouring down And it looks like the old man's getting on 1920s when he stepped to the bar Drank two drinks of the whiskey jar 1930 when the ball caved in and Made his way selling that red-eyed gin Looks like an old man's getting on. Delilah Jones was the mother of twins Two times over and the rest were sins Raised eight boys only I turned bad Didn't get the lickings that the other ones had Looks like the old man's getting on
never was the same again Daddy made whiskey and he made it well Cost two dollars and it burned my kill I cooked hickory just to fire the still Drink down a gallon and be ready to kill Brown-eyed women in red grenadine The bottle was dusty but the liquor was clean Sound of the thunder with the rain pouring down And it looks like the old man's getting on from the West Coast to form Earth Opera with me. He brought the first day, Grateful Dead record and we listened to it and Jerry was doing a version of Cold Rain and Snow on that record. And I had already been singing Cold Rain and Snow with Bill Monroe. So there was that connection. David and I went up the hill in Stinson Beach to, to Jerry's place and, and there's Garcia standing in his backyard playing banjo as we drove in. And I, I knew right away, I'm gonna like this guy. <laughs> I mean, we played one bluegrass festival, uh, Watermelon Park in Virginia. And it became apparent that Jerry was never gonna be, have any privacy at all. I mean, where David and I could sit backstage and pick with Sam Bush and John Hartford at a bluegrass festival, Jerry couldn't, as a bluegrass band playing the bluegrass circuit, would, It'd be just too difficult. Desert 
sand And I jack the trader held some turquoise in his hand By his side sat Ramanel, his long-time Indian friend He vowed that he would stay by Jack until the bitter end Had gambled everything he owned to lead this wandering life. He might have had a happy home or a tender loving wife. His hunger was for trading, trappers' furs for turquoise stone. Anything the Indians had, Jack wanted for his own. I said, Jack, do run an elk, I'll gamble all my precious stones Before I leave my body here among these bleaching bones For now my time is drawing near, I'm filled with dark regret My spirit longs to journey as the sun begins to set We've raped and killed, we stole your land, we ruled with guns and knives. Fed whiskey to your warriors while we stole away your wives. Said, run an elk, what's done is done, you white man rule this land. Lay the cards face up and play your last broken heart. Joker's wild, the ace is high. Jack bet the Mississippi River running elk raised him the sky. Jack saw him with the sun and moon and upped him with the stars. Running elk bet the rock and mountains, the Jupiter and Mars. And the sun was sinking in the west when Jack drew the ace of spades. As he smiled and passed away Jack picked up his turquoise stones And cast them to the sky He stared into the setting sun And it made a mortal cry
had been in existence for, for some time and it would really consisted of the members of the band and a couple of other people and Danny Rifkin whose idea it was to do the whole thing and it was named after our, our dearly beloved uh, roadie of the past Rex Jackson so it had it already had a spirit to it at that point but it was the band and, and, and it didn't include any of the women so finally, at some point, somebody somebody said, "Oh, we should we should have at least one woman on the board." And they 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 asked me to come on the board. So I said, "Sure," because I had never been part of a foundation. I didn't really know how nonprofits worked, and you know, it all sounded really interesting. And going to the I'll talk about going to the meetings for a minute because they all just lined up at their big Grateful Dead table, and mostly it was. Danny coming up with great ideas to, to send send some money to, but also we got to we got to just shoot all the ideas down as fast as we could, and then come up with new ones. And there was a lot of laughing and ha haing and so on. So it was really it was really a hoot those meetings. So to fund all this, they were doing huge concerts. They were doing three day events in Sacramento at the at the Cal Expo and I mean just really mega 
So there was a tremendous amount of money actually coming into Rex Foundation at that time when the band was fully participating. So we really had some clout. So we, you know, we sort of entered the world of nonprofits with a huge bang. The Rex Foundation sort of started just with an idea and a lot of giggling. And it, you know, and it really, and it, at first it all seemed like a big joke. Oh, ha ha, we'll, we'll give money to these people. These, they'll be so surprised, you know, they're really gonna love it. And then we got pretty serious after a while and began to put money out to interesting uh, music groups that needed funding for instruments, uh, you know, trying to support actually the, the movement toward better music. And uh, I think I think that that I love that I love that part that we can that we can go out and find somebody that man all they really need is a couple grand to buy a new instrument and a couple of drums and suddenly they're working again and they're appearing and uh, you know that that feels really good. Well, I say long live Rex Foundation. You know, support and and become part of the part of the solution for a lot of people. I think that. You know, right now in particular, we've got a particularly wide uh, gap in the middle of everybody's income. You know, there's a lot of people that don't have any money for anything, and a lot of people that have money for have money for everything. And it would be really nice if if we could get all some of that working a little bit better together to keep our culture going, because we have so many beautiful cultural institutions in this country. Most of them we've never heard of. And that's what Rex Foundation really tried to do, was to bring those into the light and, and support them. And so this is kind of what we like to do. This is a tune that was uh, recorded by the Grateful Dead. We're going to give it a try. It's a... I always liked this song, anyhow. Had a great opportunity to uh, meet Jerry Garcia, actually. Through my dad, you know, he uh, Jerry told me that in 1963, he saw Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, the first time he ever saw that band in California. And he said, your dad was playing the guitar, man. That's my picture in my mind of the Bluegrass Boys. Pretty cool. You'll never 
Everybody's bragging and drinking that wine. I can tell the queen of diamonds by the way she shines. Five dollar bill, keep him happy all the time. Some other fellas making nothing at all, and you can't hear him cry. Can I go, buddy? Can I go down? Take your shift at the mine. Gotta get down to the Cumberland mine. Gotta get down to the Cumberland mine. That's where I mainly spend my time. Poor man got to walk that line Just to pay his union dues I don't know now I just don't know If I'm going back again I don't know now I just don't know If I'm going back again I don't know now I just don't know If I'm going back
watch it shine, watch it shine.
real good time Hey, hey, hey. 
Oh, man.